realizing that one could time travel within his own lifetime, Dr. Sam Beckett led an elite group of scientists into the desert to develop a top-secret project known as Quantum Leap. Pressured to prove his theories or lose funding, Dr. Beckett prematurely stepped into the project accelerator. In the blink of a cosmic clock, I went from quantum physicist to Air Force test pilot, which could have been fun if I knew how to fly. Fortunately, I had help, an observer from the project named Al. Unfortunately, Al's a hologram, so all he can lend is moral support. Anyway, here I am, bouncing around in time, putting things right that once went wrong. A sort of time-traveling Lone Ranger with Al as my tanto. And I don't even need a mask. You are listening to the Quantum Leap Podcast. This is Episode 6, The Color of Truth. I didn't know exactly where I was, but it was obviously too far south to be a black man. Jesse! Jesse Tyler! You come over here this instant! Maybe all I'm here to do is help a little old lady across the street. You're a black man in the South in 1955. Trust me, that is dangerous. I'm black. God's name's wrong with being called a nigger. Maybe it's just a little too close to nigger. I've never used that word, Jesse. Not to your face or behind your back. What if that's what I'm here to do? What, get involved in the civil rights movement? Mrs. Melanie Elizabeth Charlotte Trafford was killed when her car was struck and demolished by a passenger train at that crossing. Tomorrow afternoon at 518. No. That's why you're here. To save Miss Melanie from being killed tomorrow afternoon by the Alabama and Pacific. And welcome back to the Quantum Leap Podcast. I'm Albie. And I'm Heather. We're glad to have you with us today as we talk about Quantum Leap, The Color of Truth. So, Heather, uh, first impressions. This was a serious issue episode. It wasn't very lighthearted. No, there were lighthearted moments in there, which surprised me, but it was uh, dealing with an important issue. It wasn't like him and some chick. It was a social issue, a very big social issue. To be a black man in the 1950s is a big deal. I still can't believe he sat down at the counter and didn't know (laughs) until he was like, whoa. Well, like you said, I was hungry, so I sat down and figured I'd have something to eat. It's crazy because in our lifetime, it hasn't been like that. Thank goodness. I know, know, but to to look back, I just can't even imagine. Yeah, this episode, as I'm watching it, uh, a lot of uh, shock, dismay, realization of that's how it was, and it's a good thing they did this. Yeah, especially for people like us who didn't experience the 1950s or or segregation or the civil rights movement. I mean, we see the effects of it and we learned about it in history and we have our own equal rights thing going on right now. But the the different water fountains, the different entrances, the different seats on the bus, the riots, all that stuff we didn't experience. So it's, it's nice to have like a glimpse into history. Right. We know about it, but we don't know about it. Right. Not as, I guess, not as scary as the Holocaust, but still as no. I would bad. say, I would say, just as. Yeah, well, maybe it's just it isn't as it isn't portrayed as scary as the Holocaust. Maybe, maybe yeah. history doesn't give it the gravitas it needs. Yeah. And uh, also, I wanted to say we're going to talk a little bit during the show. Different words they use, different sayings they use, different things they use to demean other people that the actor said because the story was important. And we might use those words in talking about what they said. We don't mean any ill will or anything bad because we're using those words and we'll try not to. But if we talk about it, we have to talk about it. Right. We are for equal rights for everybody. Everyone. All right, Heather, episode recap, please. The Color of Truth, Season 1, Episode 7. Original broadcast date, May 3rd, 1989. Written by Deborah Pratt. Directed by Mike Vehar. Sam leaps into Jesse Tyler while standing at the entrance to a diner. Unaware that he is a black man in the Deep South during the segregationist era, he takes a seat at the counter to order lunch, prompting outcries of shock and dismay from the other patrons. 
Sam catches his own reflection in the mirror and becomes marveled that he has leaped into a black man. Two young thugs, Toad and Billy Joe, become riled with Sam's audacious action and threaten him with physical violence. Miss Patty, the diner owner, suggests Sam take the bag of lunch for his employer, Miss Melanie, and leave at once to avoid bloodshed. Sam confers and leaves the diner. As he crosses the street, he notices an old lady summoning him. Sam deduces that this must be Miss Melanie and walks over to hand the bag of lunch to her. Ms. Melanie is his demanding, though benevolent, employer and well-respected member of the community. She instructs Sam to drive her to the cemetery where she can visit the grave of her late husband, Charles Trafford, the former governor of Alabama. Sam feigns memory loss to get Ms. Melanie to direct him to the cemetery's location. Ms. Melanie becomes flustered by Sam's tomfoolery and gives him directions. The gravesite has been overrun by weeds. Sam offers to take out the weeds and discard them, while Ms. Melanie silently pays her respects. Al arrives in the cemetery and Sam boasts about leaping into a black man and how it opens up greater possibilities about the identities Sam may leap into in the future. Al, however, believes that Sam's position as a black man in the Deep South is dangerous and advises him to keep a low profile until he can accomplish his mission, saving Miss Melanie from being killed by a passenger train while driving her car across the tracks the following day. Sam, however, believes his other mission is to advance the cause of civil rights in the town. Back at Miss Melanie's home, Sam takes her groceries into the kitchen, where he is confronted by Miss Melanie's brash son, Clayton. Clayton tells Sam that his decision to sit down at the lunch counter has upset the entire town and warns him against any further recalcitrant behavior. Clayton attempts to relay his message to Miss Melanie, reminding her that her standing as a widower of a former state governor carries certain responsibilities. Ms. Melanie, however, is unconcerned by Sam's behavior at the diner and tells Clayton not to lecture her. Jesse's granddaughter, Nell, arrives at Ms. Melanie's home to collect Sam for the day. She drives him back to their house where they live with Jesse's son and daughter-in-law. Sam must fulfill one of Jesse's obligations and prepare chitlins for the upcoming church picnic. Jesse's son approaches him about Sam sitting at the lunch counter earlier in the day, warning him that such actions will provoke a backlash in the community, which will in turn harm their family. Al agrees, saying that the town isn't ready to change their prejudices just yet. Sam disagrees, stating that he has every right as a black man to sit and eat lunch. They are interrupted by a female scream. Nell is out front, staring at Billy Joe and Toad, who have just planted a burning cross in their front lawn. Sam approaches the sheriff about the matter. However, the sheriff, who is Billy Joe's father, dismisses the stunt as just a couple of boys being mischievous. Furthermore, he places the blame on Sam, saying that it was his decision to sit at the lunch counter which prompted this backlash. After the sheriff walks off, Sam angrily drinks from the whites-only water fountain to cool off. He is seen by Billy Joe and Toad, who decide that he has gone too far and resolve to take more serious action against him in order to whack him back into place. Sam, meanwhile, resumes work at Miss Melanie's home, attempting to repair her broken water pipe. They take a break and Miss Melanie prepares tea for the both of them. Sam is about to sit at the same table with Miss Melanie until she interrupts him. She says coloreds and whites are not allowed to eat together. Sam presses her on the matter, asking why she is not allowed to do so. Miss Melanie tells him it is the way things are, but Sam counters that things need to change. Nell appears at the door, but Sam tells her he cannot come home as he is going to drive Miss Melanie's car and make some repairs on it. Nell nods and walks away. As she is driving back, Billy, Joe, and Toad ambush the vehicle, forcing it to veer off the road and crash into a ditch. Nell lay unconscious, bleeding profusely. Worried that she might be seriously hurt, Billy, Joe, and Toad flee the scene immediately. Sam and Ms. Melanie continue their discussion about civil rights, with Sam telling her that one day things will change and African Americans will unite and seek equality. He tells Ms. Melanie she can use her influence and respect in the town to encourage others to change. Ms. Melanie becomes uncomfortable and steers him away from the conversation by stating that she must drive into town to buy a new water pipe. Sam insists on driving her, aware that she is destined to be killed by the passenger train later in the day. While they are driving into town, Ms. Melanie spots Nell's overturned car in the ditch. Sam pulls over and rushes down to tend to Nell's unconscious form. He picks her up, wraps a cloth around her to stop the bleeding, and puts her in the backseat of the car. Sam drives to the nearest hospital and frantically asks the staff for assistance. However, the staff tell him sternly that they cannot accept Nell, as it is a whites-only hospital, and coloreds are not allowed admittance. Sam persists, and one of the nurses leaves to call the sheriff. Ms. Melanie intervenes, using her status in the community to order the staff to treat Nell. They obey and take Nell in for surgery. Miss Melanie goes in after them, but advises Sam to wait outside so as not to cause any further unrest. Sam and Al wait outside, with Al urging Sam to drive the car away so that Miss Melanie will not get into it and be killed, as is destined to happen in 20 minutes' time. 
Sam believes Al is being paranoid. The sheriff arrives and arrests Sam for bringing Al to the hospital and violating the segregation laws. As he is being whisked into the patrol car, Sam asks the nurse to delay Miss Melanie at the hospital for half an hour. After the sheriff takes Sam away, Miss Melanie appears. Despite the nurse's instructions, Miss Melanie gets into her car and drives off. Al stays with Miss Melanie in the car, attempting to reach out to her and tell her to stop the car. Miss Melanie, however, cannot hear him and continues to drive toward the path of the passenger train, which is inching closer. Al's screams become more desperate, and just as Miss Melanie is about to collide with the train, she manages to hear one of Al's warnings and pulls off into the cemetery, avoiding collision. She attributes her miraculous avoidance of death to her late husband Charles' spirit. Sam, meanwhile, is locked away in a jail cell. The sheriff arrives to tell Sam he has dropped the charges, as Nell's accident was caused by two boys that ran her off the road, though he won't disclose their identities. The sheriff assures him that no one in Jesse's family will be harmed further, but Sam tells him it isn't good enough and that the sheriff is going to have to learn to change his ways. Sam leaves the sheriff's department and is met outside by Miss Melanie and Clayton. Clayton tells Sam he should still be in jail for his actions, but Miss Melanie tells him to mind his own business and be on his way. Miss Melanie tells Sam that Nell is in good condition and back with her own people. Sam says it was reckless and unsafe for her to be transferred while she was in such a critical condition. He tells Miss Melanie that this experience should prove to her the injustice of the town and how she can use her authority to effect positive changes. Miss Melanie, however, disagrees and wants things to go back to normal. She orders that he cease trying to change things and go into Miss Patty's diner and pick up her lunch like usual. Sam appears once more at the diner, being eyed suspiciously by the patrons, including Toad, Billy Joe, the sheriff, and Clayton. Sam collects the lunch and is about to leave until Miss Melanie appears and decides she will eat her lunch in the diner. She asks Sam to join her. Billy Joe is about to rise in protest, but the sheriff tells him to sit down. Sam happily sits next to Miss Melanie at the counter. And with that, Sam leaps. Thank you for that episode recap, Heather. And I'd also like to thank the Quantum Leap Wikia for that recap. So this episode is basically Quantum Leap does Driving Miss Daisy. Does it surprise you that I haven't seen that movie? No, not at all. I know of the movie. I think I've seen like clips, but I haven't actually seen the whole movie. I saw it when it originally came to home box office, I want to say. So it's home been a box office. Yes, it's been a while. It's H- been that long that you called it home box office the yes. last time that it aired. <laughs> HBO. But that's just on the surface. The story to this episode is very important and it's a good moral lesson for people that need that moral lesson. I'm thinking back then at that time, people that saw this episode when it aired on television, I hope it changed some people's opinions for the better. I think that people who feel that way to begin with usually don't change their minds, but it possibly gave people different perspective, hopefully. I credit Quantum Leap for a lot of my moral basis. Well, that's true because you watch it when you were younger. So I was very impressionable. I was learning wrong from right. I was a young teenager. It's a good thing that they played morality type shows while you were growing up. What would you have done otherwise? Play outside? Forget that. But um, Like Star Trek? I grew up on Star Trek and Quantum Leap. (laughs) It's a good way to grow up. Between Star Trek and Quantum Leap, I think I learned how to be a good human being and care about others and treat others with respect. It's a good thing. I actually wrote a letter to Donald P. Belisario to tell him that. I actually played outside a lot. Oh, well, now you're watching Quantum Leap. (laughs) Now I'm catching up. Yes, now you're catching up. This episode, this is the first episode that really has a message, moral, and meaning. And I almost feel unqualified to talk about this other than my own life and my own personal experiences to do with this. Besides the important morals, meanings, and messages in this episode, it's a good episode. It's uncomfortable at times for me to watch because of just... I know the actors and the person who wrote this, Deborah Pratt, you know, they did this for a reason to teach people the difference between right and wrong and misconceptions that people have and prejudices and try to correct that. But still watching what went on back then, and this is way tamed down for television, I'm sure it was a lot worse than what we saw in this episode, but it's still uncomfortable to watch, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. I mean, to think of our country to be like that, I mean... It's it's hard to look at the people that are our ancestors and and our relatives let something like that happen. They I mean they what didn't know any better. I guess that's what they're pretty much saying in this episode. 
Well, I mean, that's that's what they're that's their defense in this episode that they were born knowing that they were like born ignorant. Well, that's what Jesse's son brings up that that they were born to think that way. But I don't think anybody should be born to think they're better than anyone else. Correct. We're all just people. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It shouldn't matter. Everybody's equal. Yeah, people are people. As a society, I hope that we're better now than. I mean, as a whole, we're better, but. I'm sure there are still people who have altered opinions. I think in the United States, more percentages of people are more enlightened and better and better thinking. But you're always going to have the, I don't know how to refer to ignorant people without being (laughs) rude to them and prejudiced (laughs) against them. So I don't know. You're always going to have people that think that they're better than other people for some reason or another. But I think as time goes on, people are, they're, they're getting better with respecting human rights. I think as the generations go, a lot of our older generations that were part of the segregation time and were a part of that still have some prejudice. Oh, yes, I agree. But as the new generations are brought up, I mean, we were brought up, like I said, not in this time period. So we didn't experience this. We went to school with all shorts, all sorts of kids, shapes, sizes, colors, whatever, I mean, we were we were brought up to be friends with whoever we wanted to be friends with. I mean, it didn't really matter. So we're going to bring up our kids like that too. So as the gener as the new generations grow older and start taking over the world, you know, like hopefully when our kids are older, everybody will be equal. It's getting better, I think, because even older generations right now that even if they have changed their opinion or like love all people equally, they will still say really bad things, not knowing that what they're saying is wrong. Well, and a lot of people back then, I think just like Miss Melanie, she didn't have a problem with any of it. She just didn't want to change the world. You have to really feel strongly about something to get up and do something about it. So I think a lot of people, they just let it happen, if that makes sense. They accepted that that's the way the world was and there was nothing they can do about it. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to say that you feel a certain way, but it's another thing to get out and and stand in the riots and 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 be on the front line and fighting for a cause if it doesn't really affect you. Or you know, that's what they thought, I think back then. Right. And back then you literally put your life on the line when you were defending people's rights. Uh it's not like today where you change your profile picture on Facebook and say, you know, I support this, I support that. Now it's so much easier because we can reach the entire world with social media, with Facebook mainly. I mean, Facebook and Twitter, look at how we can communicate with the whole world like that. I think it helps. It's definitely different than picket lines and riots and sit outs or walk ins or whatever happened, you know, even though those are still part of our society when fighting for something. It's a lot easier now to get the word across the country faster. Right. It doesn't have to start at grassroots in every community everywhere. Right. The United States where we live currently, it's going through a similar thing where um, it has to do with uh, equality for everyone. Uh, Speaking of marriage equality. Mainly right now. Yeah. It's the same issue over and over again, which is the silly part of it. Like different internet memes, you'll see interracial couples holding up banners that say, you know, gay marriage is wrong, you know, and it's like, yeah, 50 years ago, you wouldn't have been able to get married either. How does your brain not comprehend that it's the same thing? Well, I know there was one and speaking of internet memes, I know there was one that um, said they'd had a picture of the boycotting from the 1950s for civil rights. And it said this is like it had people saying that we should keep we should stay segregated there was like people holding signs up that said that we need to keep separate and and the meme said this is how stupid you're gonna look in (laughs) 50 years when we look back at oh people holding up signs with hatred towards homosexuals right now yeah. yeah um but it's true i mean people are people and the sooner people realize that the better and i i think for the most part people are on board right but they're it's one of those things that it's like they're waiting for everybody to agree that 
we should have marriage equality and us as a country are never going to agree on any issue at all. <laughs> well, the problem is, uh, I think just because people have a voting majority doesn't necessarily make them right. So, when, well, duh. <laughs> yeah, uh, just because most people are wrong doesn't make them right. That's an easy way to say that, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's important for our lawmakers and our politicians to do what's right, not what's popular. And a lot of them are doing that lately. And I give a lot of people credit, you know, statewide. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll have a national thing pretty soon. Where or worldwide even. <laughs> worldwide equality, right? UN pass a bill. People are people. I don't even think marriage equality. I think just the word equality. People are people. It, and then everybody signs it. Then, then we're good, right? Well, see, the problem with the civil rights movement and the marriage equality movement that we're going through right now is people are afraid of change. Even if these laws don't affect them personally, they're afraid of changing something. They're afraid of changing what a word means. They're afraid of changing laws and thinking that it's going to affect them in some way when it, it, I, I don't know, change is good sometimes. Like, you yes. just and need to embrace it. Any change that will prevent like hatred or violence towards any group of people yeah. is a good thing. Well, I don't think a law is going to change violence towards people, but it won't. But it like, do you really think that Billy Joe and Toad in this episode, they you think four months after this, when the boycotts started and the Rosa Parks bus boycott happened, do you really think that their opinions changed? No, but. I think like changing laws of integration and forced integration and people being able to go to school with other people affected the next generation. So the laws we make today will affect future generations for the good. Oh, yeah. If definitely. That makes sense. Should I put a warning on this episode? We're going to get a little political because I know like half the people we're talking to, hopefully less than half, are going to get be upset. Hopefully these are people that watched Quantum Leap. and Well, if they saw this episode... They they get they get the meaning. If they're at home saying, uh, yay, run that girl off the road, then probably not good anyway. Yeah. I mean, this is an issue. Well, we're combining issues from 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 60 years ago. Wow. A uh, 60-year-old issue with today, which might upset some people. but That's an allegory, I guess, or an analogy or an allegory, and it's, it's the same thing. But um, back more to the racism, there's parts of the country today that it's still just as bad. Well, I don't think the race issue is just between blacks and whites in our country anymore. I know that we have um, people that are get, that get upset if things are in Spanish and in English or things like that, too. So I, I know that racism is still very prominent in our country, but the laws don't support racism anymore. Which is a good thing. Yes, very much so. So we have come a long way. I mean, it has been 60 years. We have we have come a long way, but there's still a ways to go. Right. Um, I'd say we're on the good side of the times on the issue of racism. I hope so. And even if we are, I mean, there's no way to really know, but hopefully there's going to be a point somewhere where we're also intermixed. I mean, America is such a melting pot of all these different backgrounds and ethnicities and nationalities that... I'm assuming at some point we're all just going to be one big yeah, mix. People. Right. One movie I saw about the future was the remake of The Time Machine. Really bad movie compared to the original, but it did have one good thing. Everybody in the future was the same mocha color, you know. We're all Which melting makes sense. together. It does make sense. Yeah. I mean, when people were separated by continents and there were no land bridges, you know, people look different. But now it's a global world and we're all people. Have I said we're all people yet? <laughs> okay. So now we'll talk a little bit more about this particular episode after we got the big overall issue, you know, talked about. <clears throat> Out of the way. Yes. Um, one of the first things I noticed in this episode is when Sam, Jesse, comes out of Miss Patty's place and he pats his uh, head with a handkerchief. I thought that might be something Jesse would normally do. And it seemed like a mannerism of Jesse. So I think that might be a little bit of the Swiss cheese brain and taking on other people's personalities. Yeah, or he was trying to make it look like he belonged. I don't know, but you're probably right. Yeah, he could be trying to just uh, get into character or assimilating as best he can. Assimilating. It's, uh, I didn't use it in a Star Trek reference. Oh, I just did it right there. <laughs> this was the first episode of Quantum Leap that he didn't have a love interest or a girlfriend or a possible hookup. Yeah, I wonder if they did those storylines with the women 
as a more lighthearted opening to the series. And now we're getting into the more s- serious issues. It'll be interesting to see how that goes. Yeah, I'm curious to see what the next episode is about because it kind of looks like a lighthearted one. <laughs> it's called the Kamikaze Kid, and I think it's uh, about teenagers drag racing. Yeah, it kind of reminded me of Grease a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. But yeah. I don't remember it because I haven't seen it in 20 some odd years. Yeah, but I know that you know the answers to all my my questions, but I'm wondering how many of the serious issues they'll do. Like if they'll do a serious one and then a couple lighthearted ones and then I, another serious one. And, I think that's how it goes. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So you're not like go- jumping from one serious issue to another. You don't want to get hit over the head all the time with... Uh, we get it right from wrong. We get it. Well, it's, some people don't. So it's important <laughs> to watch these and learn right from wrong. Because I, when I was young, I learned right from wrong. Did you learn not to drag race? Yes. I guess we'll talk about that next week. We'll talk about that next week. But yes, I did learn not to drag race. <laughs> For a minute there while I was watching The Color of Truth, I thought to myself, is Sam going to hook up with Miss Melanie? But no, it, it didn't no. happen. That's just wrong. This episode was written by Deborah Pratt, who is African-American female and also co-producer, creator, kind of, with Donald P. Belzario of the series. I didn't realize that she had written this episode. I know that she was a producer, but I didn't realize that she had written it. I mean, I read the recap, but I mean, before <laughs> before I read the recap and told everybody that it was her. Yeah. So it might uh, affect the understanding or impression of the story when you realize uh, that an African-American female had written this episode. That makes sense. I'm sure there were some stories that she had heard or experienced herself in there. Oh, yeah. Speaking of Deborah Pratt, did you notice the evil nurse? Can I say evil nurse? Pig butt. Pig butt nurse is uh, <laughs> like wearing a name tag and it says Ethel Pratt on it. So I wonder if that's a little homage. Probably because she wrote it. I would put my name in everything if I wrote stuff. Like everybody I knew would be a character and <laughs> like character names. So this episode starts out pretty much after the whole egg salad sandwich incident. They go to visit the cemetery. Sam and Miss Melanie go to visit Miss Melanie's late husband, who's been dead for seven years. Charles Trafford. And this is the first time we see Al in the episode, and Sam and Al get a chance to talk. Part of it bothered me a little bit. What part? Um, well, Sam was so excited that he leaped into a black man, and he says, I think the line is, if he could leap into a black man, then the possibilities are limitless. I get what you're saying with that, that you're bothered because people are people and, and all that stuff. He's leaping into other people's bodies. Right. So, so far, he's leaped into white males pretty much I think so, about yes. the same age as him, kind yeah, of. ish. So, now he's in an older black man's body. So, his point, I believe, is that it can be any age, any color, any race, any anything. Like, if they were going by DNA likeness or, you know, like somebody who looked like him, or I don't know how the process works because there's no really scientific evidence explaining it, but I don't think he meant it racist. Okay. I kind of took it as such. I, I Yeah, I, I realized that, but I, I was looking at it as a... Because Sam's not racist at all. Not at all. We find out later in the, in the episode that he's not. Well... Even when he sat at the counter and was like, I have every right, no matter what color I am, to eat lunch. Right. Um, so I don't think he meant it that way. It did kind of come off that way. So I kind, I, so I tried to look at it from a different angle. And so far, he's leaped into white males around his age, with the exception of the boxer, I believe. He's a little bit younger. Right. And the Dom I was probably a little bit older, the right. mob but boss. But basically white males up until but this point. I understand what you're saying. middle aged ish white males so i think this was just a point he was saying it can be any age any color any race any country even you know like i think so he he was was... excited because of the possibilities and not mention it because he thought that black people necessarily were a totally different type of person than than white people right does that make sense it makes sense to me now but at the time it just kind of made me feel uneasy if that right and and al's reaction was like so what you're a black man <laughs> yeah I, i'm much more with al me and al get yeah along. well i just know what you were thinking while we were watching the episode so i just tried to play devil's advocate on that one right. to try and find a different explanation because i don't feel that sam is racist and wouldn't think of it that way like he was excited 
Yeah, he was definitely happy. He was smiling. Right. He was, he's happy about it. And um, I guess from the perspective of it being a television episode, if you weren't going to mention color, then what's the point of the episode? Right. When Al said, yeah, so you're black. What about it? Then I was like, yeah, exactly. And that also shows that in the future, it's more accepting. I mean, if you watch any futuristic show, be it Star Trek or, you know. Which paved the way, by the way, for that. Well, exactly. But if you watch any futuristic show, there's equality in the people on the ship or in the community or whatever that there there's no what is it Battlestar that everyone says sir or something like yeah, that disregarding the gender right so um that's kind of my go, thought go geek cred right there Battlestar reference yeah I'm a geek wife what can I say <laughs> I'm I'm a geek by association no I think I'm I think I'm now. I have transferred over to the geek side. You're a TV talk show host on TV talk. Yeah. yeah, you're full-fledged geek. Yeah. When I start bragging to people that we bought our Dragon Con tickets, I think that a that year makes early. Me, a year early. <laughs> I think that makes me a geek. Speaking of, check us out at Dragon Con. <laughs> yeah. If any of you are coming to Dragon Con, look for us there. I know we'll probably remind you again closer to the date. <laughs> yes. We'll either be wearing a TV talk shirt or a Quantum Leap podcast shirt. Oh, we need some of those. Yeah. With my headphone design. Yeah. We got to get some for us. Or some buttons or something to hand out. Buttons. I always cut. stab myself with those. Stickers? So then Stickers. so then Al says, I've seen things that would curl your hair. So that bothered me again. Everything's bothering me tonight. I don't know why. But, you know, he... he You're a little sensitive during this episode. I, I am. I don't know. I'm like, yeah, that's not nice and stuff. Um, But then, you know, remembering who wrote it and why and to teach people, then it's like, okay, it's a lesson. We got to learn a lesson. But again, like, Al's not racist. Not so at all. Because Al, you know, coincidentally was in, instrumental in the civil rights movement. And witnessed a lot of good people go down, he said. Yeah. Uh, this brings up another point that no matter where or when Sam leaps, Al has already experienced it and is an expert in that situation, like the chitlins. He's got a great recipe for chitlins. Well, according to him, it sounds like he grew up in the South, so that would be why. That, that would make sense. Have you ever eaten chitlins? No, it doesn't even sound like something. But I'm see, I'm from up north, so it's hard because I haven't really adapted Southern lifestyles. I've never had boiled peanuts or what are some other uh, Southern I've things. eaten boiled peanuts. I've eaten grits. I've eaten mixed greens. I've uh, never had any of that greens, stuff. Uh, cornbread, a black eyed peas. Well, cornbread. All that stuff I love, uh, chitlins, I wouldn't touch them. I have not had any of that stuff except cornbread. Really? They're good. Uh, Cornbread's delicious. Chitlins might be great, but I don't want to know that I'm eating intestines. Like if I eat a hot dog uh, from a street vendor, you know, I'm probably eating intestines, but at least I don't know it. (laughs) You're not thinking about it. Right. What gets me every time is I forget that it's within their lifetime. So I'm like, how is Al there? Oh, wait, it's not that far into the future because I'm thinking like now is their time. Well, even now, this whole civil rights movement didn't happen that long ago. And in the history of the world, this is just a hiccup ago. Oh, I know. I mean, but I'm thinking futuristically. Like, right. this, <laughs> I was in the future and this was 60 years ago. So I'm like, how is he? But I have to remember that the future in Quantum Leap is 20 years ago for us. Whoa. That's confusing. <laughs> but anyway, he was probably a... a in his early 20s, late teens, when he was doing all this. We should we should have a map and put a push pin in everything that Al's done and where and when. And They're like, mm, how are you in Alabama 1955 and, and an in, astronaut training camp? And you were battling deer in Alaska at and the same time. And he was in Vietnam and a prize fighter boxer. Yeah, it's, it's great that he just... See, it would have made more sense if he was an android of some <sighs> sort. Spoilers! No, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? No, um, but uh, why? <laughs> you got me. Maybe he's just telling Sam he's an expert at these things and he's just Googling them when he's, uh, you know, with his little... Did you just spoil me? No, I'm just guessing. This is a guess. I don't think they had Google back then. I don't think they had search engines. I meant Android. Like, is Alan Android uh, and you just spoil it for as me? As far as I know, I well, I can't say either way because that would be a spoiler. Yeah. Crap. The whole reason Sam is there is to save Miss Melanie from getting hit by a train, not to start a civil rights revolution. But then again, he did leap when he sat at the counter. Right. So maybe that's 
a little bit why he was there. Maybe he had a part in it. I mean, he changed the opinion of a lot of people. I think one of the reasons he did change the minds of some people is because the sheriff's son and his toady. Toad. Right. But toady's also a thing, too. Their ignorance actually almost killed Nell, Jesse's granddaughter. Yeah. And uh, people are like, uh, yeah, we're racist. You can't sit down here. But the, they didn't go as far as, yay, you tried to kill his granddaughter and there's blood all over him still. Right. Well, like I said, people didn't want to. They just sat in the corner and watched stuff happen, I think. Like, for the most part, people just looked at him like, what are you doing? Don't get me wrong. I think the sheriff was still a horrible racist, but I think he was affected a little bit enough to, in the end of the episode, not stop Jesse from sitting at the counter. Right. Well, he pulled his son to sit back down. Which I don't think would have been the case had the whole incident not happened. Well, but see, Jesse wouldn't have let Nell drive home alone because the only reason Sam sent Nell home alone is because he was going to take the car away from Miss Melanie to save her from the train. So Jesse was going to leave and he could have potentially... Well, none of this would have happened if Sam didn't leap in because he wouldn't have sat at the counter. Makes sense. So scratch that whole thing. Well, no, but everything that he does affects everybody and everything. So that's a good point. Yeah. Nell drives like crazy. Why is she speeding that fast everywhere? Were there speed limits back then? I don't know. I'm thinking there should have been. There were no seatbelts again. Did really? you notice? No, no seatbelts again. We have yet to have seatbelts in the episode, in one single episode of Quantum Leap. Why? I have no idea. I said I would pay attention and I still didn't notice this episode. So you got me. On Not. N- well, Miss Melanie's leaning up on the seat talking to Jesse and Nell didn't have a seatbelt on or she wouldn't have flown out of the car. Good point. So maybe the hidden moral in this episode is seatbelts save lives. Maybe we should email <laughs> the man who made seatbelts and was like, did you have a problem with Donald P. Belisario? Did are, you? Are they not talking? Or green maybe or they're not friends. Maybe Donald P. Belisario yeah. has a problem with seatbelts. It might just be a thing again with the 50s. They weren't mandatory. They weren't. Oh, I'm sure. People didn't realize. I mean, if people. I just think it's funny that every single episode. But at least Sam should have buckled his seatbelt, right? Well, but in the future, there was no seatbelts. Well, because there's inertial dampeners. Oh, okay. I think it was uh, weird to see that Nell was also, I'd say, a little bit racist because she was saying a lot of things like lily white and skinny lips and... Well, let's put it this way. Think about your job. Okay. If you have a boss... Yes. ...who is not nice to you, who dictates, micromanages, treats you like crap, says things about you, and you kind of just have to deal with it because they pay you. Right. But then behind their back, you're like... You just go all wild to your other coworkers, right? Right. So, I, same kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, we're, I'm. We're both talking about our day jobs, by the way, <laughs> not our night jobs. Yeah. But well, I think everybody has, unless they have a dream job. Which, if you have a job in which you have an awesome boss, oh, we do have a we job. We do. We have a dream job now. We just <laughs> just got one. kidding. We um, do. Um, but yes, be thankful if you have an awesome boss like we do now. Yes. Um, we're still in a transitional phase from the old jobs to the new job. Right. Well, um, but yeah, if you kind of get what I'm saying, it's it's like... You, I understand. So it's They like, didn't really have a choice but to put up with the ignorant, angry people. So it's almost like a, if you don't like me, I'm not going to like you on principle. Well, if you treat me like crap, maybe sit in the back of the bus, yeah. you won't let me come eat in your restaurant, I'm Which not going to be nice Which is stupid, by the way, because you're going to lose money. Well, Rosa Parks, when she did her whole bus boycott, there were flyers handed out after she got arrested stating that how ridiculous it was because three quarters of the people on the bus were colored. Right. So if you don't let us come sit on your bus, you're going to lose business and your buses won't run because we're the majority of people sitting on your bus. Is that what the boycotts were about that they mentioned in this episode? The, the boycotts they mentioned four months from the episode that they were talking about that's the Rosa Parks bus boycott, yes. All I knew about Rosa Parks, uh, forgive my ignorance, but is that she sat on the front of the bus and that was a, she wouldn't move. She bus. didn't sit on the front of the bus. The rule was that the blacks would load from the back of the bus, the whites would load from the front of the bus. So you would load road by row. What's even worse is the black people would have to pay at the front of the bus and then go around the bus and come on from the back of the bus, go in through the back door. 
because they weren't allowed to come on from the front of the bus. And sometimes the drivers would drive away after getting paid before they got on the bus. That's messed up. So Rosa, that happened to Rosa Parks once. And it was the same driver the second time. Okay. She said she was never going to go on a bus that was driven by Blake. That was the guy's name. So she's in the front of the Black Rose. But the rule was, which was like in the middle of the bus. The rule was if a white person came on the bus, the entire row of black people would have to get up and move back so the white person could sit down because the white people and the black people couldn't sit in the same row. So the other people in her row got up and she's like, nope, I'm not moving. So she got arrested. The same guy was driving that bus as the one who drove off with her money. So she was pissed. Well, Rosa Parks was an advisor to the NAACP and one of the students who was a member of the NAACP Youth Council, was arrested for not giving up her seat in March of 1955. So I think it was like a movement that had already started. And there had been people the last decade. I mean, this this was going on for like a decade before the monumental arrest. Anti-discrimination laws had already been started to change for buses for interstate bus travel. But then the states had their own laws and it finally got to the point where the bus driver got to call the shots. So that was the problem here because the bus driver was one of those people who drove off with the money. I mean, like he was already a jerk. He violated Wheaton's law. What's that? Don't be a d***. (laughs) Well, I mean, he obviously had his own prejudices and wasn't a very nice person to begin with. So he was calling the shots. So she got arrested, even though there were anti-discrimination laws and all that stuff in place. So little history lesson on Rosa Parks. I can't believe the absurdity that people went through back then just to make themselves feel better than other people. But it, it caused so much anger. Look at the sheriff and his son, how angry they were over nothing. I mean, if just chill out. <laughs> so that was the Montgomery boycotts. Well, it's technically called the Montgomery bus boycott. Okay. I was just uh, quoting Al. I didn't know so much. It was a seminal event in the U.S. civil rights movement. Speaking of Al, did you see those pink shiny pants? He was very colorful this episode. Yes. And uh, I think you mentioned you liked his brown outfit, the brown and yellow one. The yellow reminded me of Dick Tracy. He had gold sparkly shoes on with it. It was very odd. Yeah. But he always has such flamboyant. I noticed they mentioned the Twilight Zone, which they had some episodes that had similar themes. So um, that might have been a little homage. When Sam's in jail and he's talking to Al and he's like, is all you think about is sex? Because he was so excited that he got through to Miss Melanie that he thought he could get through to other women, maybe younger women. And he admitted that all he thinks about is sex. Sam should know that by now. But Sam just laughed. He was like, yeah, I don't think he was very shocked. So what do you think about Miss Melanie's son? It's crazy that I was talking about generations learning before and her son is so ignorant. Yeah, he was in not a good person. And you're right, uh, Miss Melanie had more advanced thinking than her son. She was a son. forward thinker. Yes, her son, not so much. And she even said, mind your own business and be on your way. And yet, I give Miss Melanie credit for what she did at the end of the episode, but she still wouldn't let Jesse sit down and have tea with her. But that was earlier in the episode. Right. He changed her mind. So was that just to show an example of her growth as a character? Right. And her acceptance of him sitting at the counter was her was definitely her growth of her character in this episode. Uh, Some little things I wanted to mention um, that we noticed in the episode, the blood on everybody's clothes and dress was obviously like painted on paint. It was definitely paint. It was shiny and yeah, it was like a latex based red paint, (laughs) like not fake blood. What's your favorite part of this episode? Probably the ending where she tells him to come sit at the counter. Yeah, that made me feel happy inside. But then again, I liked watching her personal growth through this episode because she fought him right up until that last minute. So that that scene was a good, was my favorite part. Yeah, Sam's argument towards her gave her enough ambition to do what she knew was right. You can't go back into the darkness once you've seen the light. I like that. What was the meaning of this episode? What did we learn from this episode? Don't be a racist jerk. Okay. <laughs> did you want me to put that nicer? Yeah. What's, what do you, what's your take on it? Basically, racism is wrong. Any kind of discrimination against anybody else for any reason is wrong. And people are people because literally Sam is in the body of a black man. This might be a way for people, 
watching the episode originally, even now that aren't forward thinking or enlightened, that, wow, I could have been born a black man in the South in the 50s or everybody could has an equal chance of being born whoever. And just because you're one race or one religion or one orientation and not another doesn't make you better or worse than anybody else. I think what this episode says basically is no matter how you're born, whatever race, religion, sexual orientation, that we're all people and we're all equal. And it doesn't make us better than or less than anyone else. If you believe you are better than other people, you are wrong. If you think you are any less of a person than anybody else because of the way you look or... Your, the way you feel, the way you dress, anything. Yes, you're wrong. You are the best you that you can be. Sounds like Dr. Seuss. You did good. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's truly how I feel. Yeah, I agree. Who knows? This might have been an episode that had a big effect on my life to where I didn't fall in those traps of ignorance or racism. Well, they... There's been other instances where they do like the candid camera shots where people are dressed up like what Gwyneth Paltrow put on her fat suit for that movie and they taped people's reactions to her and how she got treated. And that's not even race. That's not that's just a prejudice. That's just discrimination. Yeah. Pure and simple like that. It doesn't even stem all the way down to racism. We just have our own prejudice about everybody everybody's so judgmental about everybody else when we need to be a more accepting society thank you that's well said yeah there's uh, many other issues and uh, a lot of them come up in future quantum leap episodes so look forward to lots of really hearty quantum leap podcast episodes in the future i learned all i ever needed to know from quantum leap hmm. well i look forward to having lots of life lessons i'm sure our listeners are looking forward to it too yes we can all learn together I'm sure there's lots of people listening to us now like, wow, this is a really deep episode. It is. <laughs> this is our NPR episode. <laughs> Next week, we're going to be like, so did you see that chick's hair? We'll go back to talking about beehives and teenagers drag racing. They're racing for pinks. I'm excited. Grease. I mean, Quantum Leap. I mean. <laughs> is it a musical? That would be crazy. Dude, if they break out in song, I'm so excited. We have some Facebook feedback. From Christopher Graham. Looking forward to hearing it all the way over here in Bonnie, Scotland. There are many ways you can send feedback. You can email us at quantumleappodcast at gmail.com. There you can send emails and audio files. You can tweet us at quantumleappod. You can like our page. You can like our page on Facebook, facebook.com slash quantumleappodcast. We have a speak pipe where you can go to our website and just record your voice if you have a microphone. Please give us a good review on iTunes and five-star rating. What are we talking about this week? Zulily. Zulily. It is kind of like a shopping discount deal website. It's like daily deals. Actually, they're probably like a couple days long, but they have awesome stuff for moms, the house, and kids. It's great. I know you've gotten several things from them that are pretty awesome. Yeah, we got a little toddler Star Trek shirt, which was pretty cool. And they have lots of Disney stuff, toys. Holiday stuff, Halloween costumes, Christmas decorations, Christmas outfits, What's sweaters, th- scarves, jewelry, shoes. Got my daughter little skater shoes. Uh-huh. It's awesome. What's the latest thing you got from them? I got a pink tool set for my daughter. It's from Recycled Plastic, but they're like pink, purple, and green little screwdrivers and hammers. Really good deals on this website? Oh, yeah. It's usually like half price for all their stuff, and you always get a pretty good deal. So how can people find out more about Zoo Lily? On our website, you can click the banner or you can go to quantumleappodcast.com slash Zulily and find out more information there. How do you spell Zulily? Z-U-L-I-L-Y. Thank you very much. Zulily, I'll check it out. We were doing things in the first season that as television goes, you don't get to do very long. But for instance, when you go and look at at this episode, um, The Color of Truth, the diner scene... um, We built two diners, and the diner on the other side of the mirror, there was a huge mirror over the the counter, and the diner on the other side of it was the mirror opposite, the direct opposite, to the point of the buttons being sewed on the opposite sides of the uh, shirts, the lettering on the the shirts and everything being back. Every detail was put into this other full room. The extras, the double extras, everything, so that when I walked in and sat down at the counter, he walked in and sat down in the counter in the other set across from me, 
and you could see and the, how they shot it. You could see me, and you could see him walking, sitting down, and to his right was a guy in a sailor suit, and my right, and it was it was amazing stuff. But it took forever. Next week, Sam leaps into 1961 into the body of Cam Winston, a pimply teenager. Yeah, he's got some pimples. Imagine going back to 1961 and being 17 again. I'm a dork. Bring your wheels. It's the to the drive-in. Chocolate shake and a cherry coke. Sam returns to keep his sister from a brutal marriage. Did Bob do it? No, he didn't. Don't lie for him. And teach a future superstar how to moonwalk. Quantum Leap Wednesday. And remember to check us out on TVTalk.com and the TV Talk app. We are currently hosting The Vampire Diaries and Castle. Yeah, they're only 20 minute shows. So you get a little glimpse of our, of, you get to hear our voice a little bit. Yes. T- a couple times a week. If you miss us in between Quantum Leap podcasts, you can hear us at least twice a week on TVTalk.com. Even if you don't watch Castle or Vampire Diaries, there's about 60 other shows on t- the TV Talk app. It's a great, great place to uh, find your TV podcasts. And we're not just saying it because we're on there. No, it's great. And the app is really cool. And especially if you always want to leave a like voicemail and because they have a just a little button that you have to push. It's real easy. That wraps it up for this episode of the Quantum Leap Podcast. Please join us next time when we'll be talking about episode eight. We're almost at the end of season one. Yes, we almost made it through a whole season. There's a couple more to go. And uh, hopefully you'll be along for the ride. I'm Heather. And I'm Albie saying, always remember to obey Wheaton's Law. We'll see you next time. If the truth be known, once I got into it, quantum leaping turned out to be a lot of fun. So far, I've been able to save two lives, one ball game, and a pig. I fought for the faith of a nun and against the mob. Put together three couples, a father and daughter, and the lyrics to Peggy Sue. Like I said, stepping into someone else's shoes can be a lot of fun. B8. Bingo. Now all I have to figure out is whose shoes I'm wearing and the path I'm walking. But since I'm here and I'm hungry, how about something to eat? Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Quantum Leap Podcast. Go to quantumleappodcast.com to listen to new episodes. The Quantum Leap Podcast is not affiliated with Belisarius Productions or Universal TV. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter to get behind-the-scenes information, exclusive content, and to be notified first when a new episode is available. The thoughts and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual and do not necessarily represent or reflect those of the Quantum Leap Podcast, Baron Space Productions, its partners, or affiliates. The Quantum Leap Podcast is edited by Albie. The Quantum Leap Universe and all it contains is property of Belisarius Productions and Universal TV. No infringement is intended. The Quantum Leap Podcast is a Baron Space production. I used to be afraid of change. I used to, when I checked out of the grocery store, I would say, no, please keep the change. It scares me. You're such a dork. But um, but really, people are afraid of change, even if... What does the fox say? Ding, 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 Misconceptions. They're pre-misconceptions. Did I just make up a word like W? Pre-misconceptions? Is that a word? Um, I, I don't know. Uh... I hope it changed some people's prejudices. <sighs> prejudices? You're picking all the great words. Speaking of Dever... Speaking of... Who's texting you over there? Tell your girlfriend we're recording. So, the whole reason... Uh, man, I was doing so good. Sam and Miss Melanie go to visit her... Uh, I go so close there. Yes, we are... Uh. We are... Uh.